and good morning, everybody. Um, Danny Riley reporting from his post in his closet. I've been, I don't know how many of you know this, but after the construction of my house and we moved everything out of the, all the stuff into the garage, uh, I went into the living room. My wife iced me, put me in the closet. But that's about how that goes. You know, um, you don't really need a lot of room to trade, but, I mean, you need a little bit of elbow room, you know. And this isn't really exactly my thing. Um, maybe when she goes back to Chicago, I'll move it all back into my bedroom, which is a lot nicer to be in. But anyways, it's not about the comfort of um, where you sit. It's really what you know and how you acquire that knowledge. And um, yeah, exactly, Rod, exactly. Um, you know, look at we're going to start. I'm going to start this out by just saying that one, we want to thank everybody that's come in today. Um, we've got a pretty heavy duty uh, webinar here with a lot of slides. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to be going between two different screens. So it, it's, when I start the webinar, I'm going to turn the um, the camera off. Um, we've got like some 40 slides, but I don't want to, I don't want people to have to, you know, be sitting around for hours and hours. So we're going to kind of go through this kind of fast. Um, there's a lot to talk about and I wrote a little note down. I, again, I want to thank everybody for coming in. Um, kind of what we're going to do here today, we're going to kind of show you the good or no, we're going to kind of show you the bad stuff that's going on. And then we're going to show you kind of the good stuff that's going on. And then Marlon Cobb is going to take over with his new product, Hotspot, which is really, really a cool product. As I've said many times, you know, we're not about a hard sell. Um, we, we don't believe that you're supposed to push products down people's throats. Um, we have a full, you know, if you took our, if you took our forum, and you became a member there, and you know, two, three weeks after you were in there, you don't like it, we give you 100% of your money back. If you you email us and say, hey, Danny, this doesn't fit with what I'm with what I'm looking for, no problem. You know what I mean? To each his own. Everybody has their own idea of what they're looking for, their own philosophy of trading, um, and that's what makes trading so special. I th I think you know. Um, one of the things I would say before I jump into the slides is I, I talk extensively to the pit bull. And back about three weeks ago or a little bit before that, I started writing in the opening print that I thought that there was something wrong with the market, that there was some kind of divergence. Um, as the Dow was making new highs and the Russell and the NASDAQ and the S&P were kind of weak. And after talking to Marty and I talked to him, God, three, four times a day. Um, you know, he started talking to me about um, the charts. He does, he used to do like 600 charts a night. Can you imagine that? Now, that's really what I call dedication to trading. And I believe at the end of the day, that's part of why he is so success successful. He spends so much time doing research. Um, you know, he trades enormously during the day and then takes a break like everybody does after the markets close and has dinner and um, then he goes back into what he calls his war room and he sets up his charts and all the things that he thinks matter to the markets and again a lot of the things that he tells me it doesn't really matter because a lot of these old things that he used to look at like the trend um, the weighted and the unweighted trend are, is an indicator that he uses it hasn't really mattered. As the markets have been going down, the trends remain strong, but now it's started to weaken a little bit. And he told me on Friday, he's very concerned about Monday. Um, and, you know, um, the way the markets acted on Friday, you had this big rally. And again, one of the things I think that, that's important is that the overall price action of the S&P, meaning what it does on a you know, minute to minute basis, what it does on an hourly, what it does on a daily basis. We haven't seen price action like this in a long time. Um, the S&P has been down, I think 11 out of the last 13 days that we haven't seen anything like that for a long, long time. And I personally, I think that's gonna continue. 
But anyways, look at, um, like I said, we've got a lot to talk about. I don't want to waste a lot of time on this kind of stuff. Um, what we'll do, um, what we'll do is we will provide you the slides for the entire webinar so you can look at them and go over them and be able to kind of figure out what parts you like and what parts you don't. But what we'll do is I'm going to jump off the, um, the, I'm going to jump off the, um, I, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to turn off the video. Excuse me, I'm, my head's scatterbrained. Um, I'm going to turn off the video, and then I'm going to start the slides. And like I said, we're going to kind of go through this kind of fast. And um, there's a lot of notes that I've got to go back and forth from. So anyways, I want to thank everybody for coming in. I hope you have a great weekend, and we're going to try to knock this out as quick as possible. Okay, this is just a little funny, <laughs> little funny slide. You know, the, since March 2009 low of the S&P, we all know that the S&P has rallied from the 666 low. Um, we all know that the S&P has rallied 30, 335%. There's a lot of variables going on. There's a lot of macro and global um, problems with the stock market right now. And um, is the wall falling down? I, I don't know if it is or it isn't. I, I really don't. Um, I'm I'm a bull market guy. I like the upside, but you know what? I like the volatility. I like buying the rips or the dips, and I just love selling the rips. Um, I've had one of my best probably back-to-back -back weeks in probably a couple of years, and um, I've switched to trading the NASDAQ futures, which I don't know. Uh, maybe they're more risky, but they pay a lot quicker, and I like that kind of stuff. But anyways... So I, I don't I don't know. Is the wall falling down? That's up to you guys to tell me. I don't know. I think it, it looks like it's got some cracks in it. Um, one of the big problems that the markets are um, seeing right now is, you know, Europe did all this quantitative easing, and they're, they're, they're nowhere near out of getting out of their quantitative easing problems. Um, and what the IMF has been talking about is they've been saying that they thought that there was a scenario where they were going to see growth and capital inflows, but actually what they believe is over the next decade there's going to be outflows. Now, this is not a good thing because the emerging markets have been weak, and as we all know, Europe has been especially weak. Um, and on top of that, we all know about the Asian markets. Um, let me get back to my other set of slides here. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm not really, I don't really want to get political. Um, excuse me. I don't, I don't really want to get political, but, um, you know, I think we are losing friends around the world. Um, you know, they, they say that the, the strategy, the tough trade strategy by Trump is working and that the European bloc is united. But I do agree with one thing. I think we are kind of losing friends around the world. Um, you know, and it doesn't seem to bother the Trump administration. And I, I'm a backer of Donald Trump, but I'm also a little bit weary of taking on the world. That said, so far, the art of the deal has been working with Canada, with Mexico, um, Europe. Um, I know that last Thursday, um, President Putin came out. He was gloating about what he sees as the end of the United States world dominance due to its growing mistakes. Well, <laughs> I don't think that I don't blink think Vladimir Putin has a lot to lot to say. Uh, the country is very poor. He's said to be worth a couple billion dollars. Um, have they moved into areas um, where the United States? was dominant. I, I think they have. But at the end of the day, um, these tariffs that, that, you know, Trump put on, Trump put on the Europeans were, were right. Um, when they import cars into the United States, there's no tariffs. But when we import our cars into Europe, there's a 15 to 20 or 25 percent tariff put on them. And I, I disagree with that. I, I think that that's right. We've got to do We've got to do what's right for our nation. Um, 
let me move forward. I've got to go to got to go to my other side slides. Um, you know, they keep talking about the gap um, that how much technology is outperformed and versus the Chinese peers. Um, we all know that the S and P's what about up about three or four percent right now, um, and the and the Shanghai Composite is down 30 percent. Now, I think that there's a lot of risk in this. If you go back to August of 2015, when they were looking at looking at the Chinese um, production numbers and stuff, there was a Monday and, and during you know the markets got real weak on a Friday, and then in then on that Monday, the Dow dropped a thousand points. How long can this go on? I don't know. According to Goldman Sachs, historically, most periods of divergence between the U.S. and global markets have lasted about a half a year, um, and have and involved the emerging markets playing catch up. I don't, I don't know. One notable period. One notable period. Um, in which the U.S. fell and became in line more with the performance of the emerging markets, I hate to say this, um, it was in 2001 after the, uh, the dot-com bubble burst. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to um, whether or not these are the same types of, this is the same type of scenario as we were in, in, you know, during the tech bubble. Um, obviously, technology is outperformed, but it is an anomaly, um, and clearly, the United States has done much better. Do, do we credit that to Trump's initiatives? Um, I kind of think we do. I, I, I do. I, you know, right now, there's more, there's more jobs available in the United States than there are people to fill those jobs, and that's, I, I, I don't know the exact date of which that, it's like, 25 or 30 years that it's been it's been since something like that occurred. So, you know, things are seemingly working better. Um, oh, you know what I? So, anyways, um, I wanted to talk about something called the blackouts and. Um, it's a it's it's a little known fact, and and the the thing is that blackouts happen when when companies buy their own stock back. You know, it's got a lot to do with uh, buy stock buybacks, and what it is is companies cannot trade their own stock during the earnings season, in which their in which their results are going to be um, posted. So there's what they call a blackout period. And this happened, the, the, lab, the previous blackout period um, was in February. And if you recall, that was when it coincided with the Facebook um, information where they, let, that, where they allowed everybody, they allowed that company to take all the um, information of everybody that signed up on Facebook and use it. But these blackout windows have been a major problem for the stock market. And I, they're going to continue to be. Um, you know, one of the things about um, stock buybacks that have, have been very, very, very bullish for the stock market, um, the, the part about that, the big part about that was what was going on when they were, the United States was doing all that quantitative easing and they were lowering rates to zero. It made it zero borrowing costs for these companies to do their own, to buy back their own stock. Um, now these blackouts have caused some big movement over the last several quarters and not a lot of people talk about it. Um, the, the buybacks are especially powerful lately um, and the flush, flush with the excess cash from the tax cuts and strong economy, the US, the U.S. companies are on track to repurchase one trillion dollars of, of their own stock this year. It's the first time over ever, according to Goldman Sachs, that um, and the, that these looming blackout periods pose near-term risk to the market. Um, now, on Friday, October 12th, Wells Fargo, um, in their earnings call, 
they indicated that they're going to be an aggressive buyer of their own stock. With repurchases tri um, tripling last quarter's nearly $7 billion, um, in stock repurchases. Now, that I guess that's a good thing, but... When you've got so much, when you've got so many different companies buying back their their stocks, and interest rates are going up, there could be there could be a lot of ramifications to this. Now, let's see. Well, I don't know where that. There was a chart that we were going to put up. Well, the, I, I'm not sure where that chart is. It's it was up the Nasdaq of the week of October 8th. Where let me tell you where. Jeez, oh, I don't know where it is. Um, we did have it in here. Um, but anyways, um, I think that the, that week, it should be right here. I don't know where it is. Um, that week, the NASDAQ fell 11% during the blackout period. And I think that this is, like I said, we're going to provide all these slides, and we'll provide all the information with them so that you guys can review them. But these blackouts have become very, very important. The, the numbers are lies from the U.S. debt. Yes, I don't disagree with that. Um, you know, John Doherty, if you could do me a favor and put up that chart. Um, but like I said, we're going to move through this kind of fast because we have a lot of different slides. Um, okay. Okay. Now, I think this is a re really interesting. Um, I was there in the 1987 crash, and um, it was a, it was a hellacious day. And during during that time, that this is when Paul Jones from Tudor made his made his name for himself. Um, you know what? The hell with it. Um, this is when Paul Jones made a name for himself in the S and P. He would rotate around the S&P pit. He used our desk. He had his own desk. He used, like, Dean Witter. He used, like, four or five different firms. And in the weeks leading up to the 1987 crash, he was selling through all these different desks. We'd get phone calls. It would be Paul Jones. He'd, hey, Danny, this is Paul. Can you, sell, can you sell 500 for me? You know, and they were testing the waters. And then if the market moved up against them, they, they'd buy him back to another desk. But... Not, not. They were a big seller in the S and P, and during that time, the model that he was using had a 92% correlation um, between the movement of stocks from from the 1920s, and it it was um, it was an analog chart. Now, Dave Trader Dave from our forum uses analog charts, and a lot of people say that they're that they're outdated, that they don't work, but um, today's updated analog chart correlates with the S&P in 1978 and 1987, and um, I think it's an interesting thing. Now, I'm not saying that the stock market's going to crash. I'm not. Um, yeah, no, Paul, Ron Paul Jones was the best, and he still is. Actually, he moved to West Palm Beach. He's only about 20 minutes from the house. Um, Is this being recorded? Yes, it is, Mark. Um, but the the correlation chart is pretty unbelievable. Um, here it is. I mean, is it? Is it? You guys tell me. Is it starting to look like 1987? If you guys would do me a favor, give me a yes or give me a no. Um, I think the chart looks very similar, and I think the markets are very extended. But I've kind of thought that they were extended for a long time, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a 1987 crash. What I talked to the pit bull about yesterday is everybody's concerned about a, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that think that. I do. I really do. Um, when I talked to the pit bull yesterday, I said, you know, looks familiar, doesn't it, Kelly? Um, what I, when I was talking to the pit bull yesterday, I said, you know, everybody's worried about a 10% correction. Um, they do, Ron. Um, Everybody's worried about this 10% correction stuff or 20% correction stuff. When you've got the S&P up, you know, 335% off its lows, who's to say that you couldn't have a 30 or a 40% correction? Um, and 
I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but I personally, and again, I'm a bull market guy. I, I, I love the long side, but I'm a little concerned. I think that there's reason to be concerned here. Um, you know, the global macro picture isn't all that great. You've got these um, foreign markets that, I mean, in Europe, they've got all these different countries and are still indebted. You know, the, the yield on the Italian bonds. I mean, yeah, I guess they got a budget, but um, it's, diff it's different this time. We have a strong pontus that prior times we didn't. I guess, Leon, you're, you're right. Yeah, it is. It's much different. But um, and I and I, I you know there was somebody on Twitter talking about the um, you know the caravan of immigrants coming toward the United States, and he started saying that I was a racist. I'm not a racist. I, I'm America first. I think that you know and, and, and if you're in France, you're probably France first. If you're in Poland, you're probably Poland first. You know what I mean? Every country has to you know want to be behind their own country, and I like what Trump's doing. I'm just not sure that this kind of banging hard stuff is making friends. I mean, we've, we've, we've had allies and friends that have been around for, you know, 58 since World War One and World War Two, And um, is that Trader Dave? Yeah, no, Trader Dave says more like 9.5 year low, looks like 1942, 1984 into November, December. Could be a deep kind of flash crash, like '87, quick and nasty. Well, Dave's an analog guy, and I and I wanted Dave to come in here today because he constantly works on his analog, and it's very interesting stuff. But anyways, um, we right now we're in the longest bull market in history. I mean, so when does it end? I, I don't know. I, I really don't. I, I I don't want it to end, but I think that there are cracks in there. Um, they say here, let me, t let me get to my other notes. Um, they, say bull, they, they say bull markets don't die of old age, but what can, kill, what can kill a bull market is a recession. When that happens, the economy declines and corporate profits decline and stocks prices fall. When the bottom line shrinks, so does the stock market. So... Is, are we at that stage yet? I, I don't know. I, I mean, God, it's gone, so, it's gone so much further than what everybody thought it would do. At some point, there has to be a correction. The other part that concerns me, and I don't know if you guys are following this that much, is existing home sales has been down 10 months in a row. That's not a good thing. I mean, you've got to really kind of look at this, you know, with a bigger, with a bigger um, perspective, but that said, you know, um, I don't know. I just, I got this funny feeling, you know, it's, um, let me get to my earnings growth. Um, you know, look at earnings growth is the strongest in a decade. You know, I, I don't know. I, can, can it continue? Well, you know, the big problem with this is if you, if you talk to the, if you, you know, if you listen to the talking heads on Wall Street, they always talk down the earnings going into the beginning of the earnings. Um, but yet the earnings always come out higher than expectations. I just don't. Um, why do you like to trade the NAS and not the Russell? Uh, I don't know. I don't think the Russell moves really quick, too. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a fast mover, too. But I, but I really just like the action of the NASDAQ. I've got, I've got a chart here that's my moneymaker chart. I can see it's an imbalanced chart. I can see what's trading on the bid and offer. It's got signals that it provides me. On Friday, it actually gave me a signal at the high of the day to sell the NASDAQ. So I've got the same thing going with the S&P, but um, I don't know. I, I like the speed of the NASDAQ. Um, so earnings growth is the strongest in a decade. Can it continue? I guess it can. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to this. And, and I, I think that at some point, we've got to have a substantial pullback. And like Dave said, maybe we have some kind of like 87 style, like flash crash that would just kind of wash this thing out. 
Uh, Seth, I've got 20, I've got 2680 as a key level on the downside. Um, stocks don't t typically do well in rising interest rates. No, they don't, Kelly. That, and that's really what this is all about, I believe. I think that's, I think that's the nemesis behind the whole thing. And that's why Trump can, and we'll talk about the yield curve. Um, let me get to my other slide. Um, you know, the problem with the rising interest rates is it makes it harder for the government to pay back its debt. And I don't know, what, how much did they rack up in quantity? How much debt did they rack up in um, quantitative easing? Um, how many, was it $2 trillion? I, I can't remember the exact number. But as the Fed starts to pay back that money, um, higher interest rates makes it hard for them to borrow, you know, in these bond auctions. It, it makes it, it pushes, the, the yield becomes inverted or it has become inverted. And that's never a good sign. I mean, if you look at the chart, the flattening yield curve, um, it, it, it's just, the, these yields are going up. And I, I think that as that happens and interest rates continue higher, the stock market's going to struggle. And the big thing about this, I think, and, and Trump is complaining about this. Um, I'll talk to you about metals in a minute, Mike. Um, the big thing about this, and I, I see that Trump is, you know, he's blah, blah, blah on the Fed about raising interest rates. You know, there's cycles in which there's low rates and there's cycles which, in which there's higher rates. And you can't keep rates down forever. Um, and we've been through a period here where, I encourage people like crazy on Twitter to go back and refinance their homes. And uh, and that was when the 30-year mortgage rate was like, I want to say, 3%. And now I think the 30-year mortgage rate to the jump to the highest it's been since the credit crisis, and I think they were quoting it at 5.1%. So when you look at all this stuff and you look at the um, – and you look and you, you you look at these rates. You look at the slowdown in, in new in in home sales. You know it, it doesn't it doesn't bode well for the stock market. It, it, all these parts are intricate parts of the, what have been driving the stock market higher. And um, I agree with what Kelly said. You know when rates when rates go up, stocks tend to go down. Um, the Fed funds rate could have killed the bull. Here, let me get to my other. Um, I, the Fed funds rate are really, really, really important. It's just, it, it's connected to the yield curve. And uh, I believe once you start kicking these rates higher, if the, you know, I personally, I don't think they should do, do a December rate hike. I think with the stock market moving around the way it is, uh, all the the jump jump in volatility. How much did the VIX get up to? I mean, it got up to 28. Um, it was, and, and I warned people when the VIX was at 11 that 11 was like a danger zone. Um, deficit, Michael, a government deficit uh, as of September, 1.2 trillion. Thank you, and 550 billion in interest payments this, this year. Wow. So, you know, once they start paying this money back, it, I, I think it's going to put a strain on the markets. And it has put a strain on the markets. And I don't really think that there's anything really um, abnormal about what's going on. The markets have just gone so far. And we've had no major corrections. And, again, we're going to make these um, slides available to you um, and all the explanations to them. Um, this is from... So here, I've given you all the bad stuff, right? I'm trying to supply you some stuff that are some of the negatives. I think that we know Europe. I think that we know that the um, emerging markets are weak. Um, and what it is is there's a lot to talk about here. But Jeff Hirsch was very kind. He gave me this to, um, to go through what the cycles are for the midterm elections and what the markets look like historically going into the end of the year. Now, um, there's a promo code here. Maybe John could put up the promo code. I, I think, you know, 57% off for the Stock Traders Almanac. I, I personally, 
I have a stock traders almanac. It's right here. And I, I look at it all the time. I, Marty, the pit bull taught me about this. And I know that some people say that there's not a lot of relevance between historical stats. I, I totally disagree. Um, you know, and I think Trader Dave would say the same thing. His analog stuff that he does is always referred to something that occurred at another date and another time. And he's a very good trader. And the fact that he he has stuck with that, um, you know, the analogs, to me, shows that he he really is he's got a very good technique about him. Um, but like everybody, you know, you hit and you miss. You got to when you miss, you got to move on to the next trade. So um, I, I got to I can I'm going to try to do this, but I don't want to take a lot of time about this. Um, Fed history. They always screw up. Yeah, they do. They have a lot of history. But anyways, the midterm elections, um, fourth quarter um, sweet spot launch pad um, points, out, point out, um, points out the weak spots. Um, notice the weak spots, the second quarter and orange quarter, uh, quarter, second quarter and third quarter, the sweet spot of the four-year cycle highlighted in black is the fourth quarter and the midterm and and year to second quarter and pre-election. Um, these, these are actually pretty favorable stats. Um, what's coming around the corner from the October 2018 through June, June 2009? Um, for the Dow Jones, the S&P since 1994. Um, Again, we're going to give you these slides. I, I I went through this stuff. It's hard for me to it's it's hard for me to evaluate all this stuff and then not have like something in my hand to read out. But I don't want to go through all this stuff because we'll give you guys the information to look at it. It's quite interesting. Um, slide five. Um, 2018 tracking midterm January election trifecta. Um, the January trifecta is the Santa Claus rally, the first five days of the January barometer, all positive as they were let this year. As you can see from the graph, when we have a positive January indicator trifecta in the midterm year, as, as we've had it in, as we've had this year, gains, gains for the year are well above average. And the suite, and the suite has begun in September as represented by the red line. And it's right, it's a, you can see it. Um, despite the early year pullback this year, you can see the thick purple line. The 2018 is on track for the midterm January trifecta pattern. Um, slide six, year to date gains, not robbing from year end. Well, we don't know that right now. It looks like they're getting pr pretty well robbed right now, but I got a feeling, and I'll talk about this in a couple minutes, with the, with all the gains this year, talk of robbing, not so much, says um, Stock Traders Almanac. Jeff, uh, gains clearly a bit more robust after bigger correction. Yeah, well, there, I, I don't know. The NASDAQ was up robust. The S&P has not really been that robust. Um, Dow has not been that robust. Sweet, um, sweet spot still strong after big year-to-date gains with 16.8% gain, uh, second to the last column on the right. So we will, again, we're going to give you guys the whole webinar so you can go through the, through the, through the um, slides yourself. Um, Midterm rally in the suite, um, suite with January trifecta. Um, same with trifecta, um, still still solid um, with a 16.5% gain. He's what he's basically saying is that the markets are going to get through the midterm elections, they're going to close strong, and then you'll be looking at the January effect. Um, slide eight from uh, Stock Traders Almanac: uh, 40, 47 to 70% gains off the midterm low. A Dow Jones average, Dow Jones average of 47.4 percent gain from the midterm low to the pre-election high. Nasdaq average gain 70 percent gain from the midterm 
low to pre-election high. Note, the note cluster of midterm January and October lows and pre-election pre -election December high. So again, um, most of the stuff that he's pointing out is very bullish. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the way this is going to work is we're going to remain a little bit weak up until the up until the midterm elections. I think after the midterm elections, and I think there's going to be increased volatility right into that. And so does the pit bull. He thinks we're just going to remain in this big, big whipsaw chain, whipsaw of trading range. But again, on Friday, he told me that he was very, very concerned about the way the market acted, and that he was looking for something really negative to happen on Monday. Um, let's see. Slide nine, um, technical trigger, best six months, best and worst six months for the, M, the MACD. Using the MACD improves the six months by selling in May. Uh, the BSM and plus MAC is a 91, is a 9.1 versus 7.5 using the month end. Um, I'm not sure about all this stuff, you guys. I haven't read up on it all, but. Um, I, you know, obviously, we'll give you guys all the stats and everything. You can look them up yourself. And you can go through it. And as again, I said, I didn't want to take a hell of a lot of time because we've got so many slides. Um, best six months, we know about that. Um, best six months are start in November, end of October, November, and last till the end of April. Um, so there's nothing really there that is that that we don't already know about. Now, we, Mr. Topstop has been invited. We've talked about this. We're going to China. Raj from Bank of America, Kevin Coy that used to work for Peter Stottlemyre from the Market Profile, um, and Shy Stock and myself. And when Kuhn was here the, from China, he went from Chicago to New York to, to my house here in Delray, and um, we had a long talk about this, and I, I think relations with China are very important. Um, do I agree that the trade wars, that the trade situation with China is a good thing for the United States? No. Um, hey, Kuhn, how are you? Um, anyways, we're going to kind of whip through this, but this is kind of a sediment of the way Chinese people think, and that's Kuhn right there. He's in China right now. Um, from the election day, from good expectations to disappointment. Um, obviously, it is it is the recent co constant hostile practices against China that makes most people China not like Donald Trump. Even though we keep a favorite impression during his election two years ago, I'm afraid it is almost a sure thing that things that we have changed our our thoughts. Now, this is not meant to be, this is just food for thought about the, the, the mentality of the way the Chinese think. And um, as you can see, these are different perspectives from different people. And most of them, most of these comments um, are fair, they're positive. They don't, they don't, like, like, like we, we don't have a lot to say about when our government, when Donald Trump decides to go off and do what he does. We're just the people from, you know, we're just the people. We voted for him. We hope that he's going to do his best. But like this woman said, China doesn't treat America as an enemy. We want to be friends with America. I think that the superpowers should make the world a better place, make the world better altogether. Um, Sino relationships cannot be sustained by being tough. The U.S. cannot impose its own thinking on China. Peace and friendliness are the most important thing. I think that there needs to be communication on, as, and both countries work toward a common goal. I got to agree with that. I, I do. I, I, I don't think that beating, you know, come to a, come to a, get, get, come to a deal with these tariffs and move on. Let's not let this roll into uh, what's going on in the South China Sea, 
you know, provocations, a possible war or combat, um, first impressions on Donald Trump. And again, you guys can, you guys are more than welcome to, um, oh, you already, JD, you know our area. You knew somebody working in a <laughs> Boca boiler room. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, you work in a boiler room now, you get, you're going to get thrown in jail. But first impressions on Donald, Donald Trump, President Twitter. He has a big mouth. He, he is a big mouth president, big V on Twitter. Uh, a down to earth, a down to earth person. I'm not sure. One minute it's uh, kind of not a big mouth. Now he's a down to earth person. So it seems he doesn't like to hide any thoughts in his mind. We cannot say it's a mature practice or not, but he, he has a clear practice. Um, you know, and Kuhn can come in and talk about this a little bit. He is somewhat ir uh, ir irrational. Um, Chinese people make his image up into different things and online chat emos. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. First impressions on Donald Trump, straightforward. He dares say, he dare say someone dare not to say. Radical, radical issues. Not a bureaucrat like pre previous presidents. No, he's not. Cohen, you're 100% right. Um, you know, but you can read this stuff for yourself. A merchant, a merchant's way of thinking. He's not a pure politician, but a businessman. Trump is a pure merchant. His names, prices, and bargains on every aspect that he could be good or bad for U.S. economy. I got to agree. It's the art of the deal, you know. Um, second reflection on Donald Trump. Uh, recognitions that are worth mentioning. Service for the interest of Native American people. Uh, revitalized manufacturing industry, boosting employment rate, and making it historically low. He's done a great job in that. Um, but the consequences of it is a sacrifice of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and the rest of the world. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, I agree with what you say, Kuhn. Um, he's, got a, he's got an America first policy. And for years, the United States has always been out there lending its hand. And this is the first president that I can remember, other than Ronald Reagan, that kind of had a tough stance on putting America first. So, you know. He's one of the mo he's one of the toughest U.S. presidents Chinese government has ever dealt with. Uh, protectionism is somewhat populism. Well, it is. Um, second reflection on Donald Trump: for assumptions about political practices by Trump, Trump was strong ab abroad, fulfilled his campaign promises, committed a narrow to a narrow trade deficit, increasing political votes, and seeking re-election. Well, the re-election still kind of, we don't know about the re-election yet. We still got to get through to his first term. But uh, Trump is a business that plan, applies the art of trading to an extreme. Trump aims to create chaos around the world to attract investment back to the United States and help America be great again. I don't know if he, I don't know if he's trying to create chaos, but his style has definitely kind of created some ambig, you know, people, People don't like that hard push, but um, to completely change the international order and let the United States get more benefits in international co cooperation and exchanges. Well, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, like, again, I think every country puts itself first, and I think China does. Kun, don't you think China puts itself first? Um, to contain China's rise in power, trade negotiations are only a cover. The battlefield is trade and is not the, the main battlefield for sino us conflict. The field of science and technology is, and the worst, at its worst, a return to the Cold War. Well, I, I hate to say it, but I think you're right, Kuhn. We, I think we are already kind of in a Cold War. Um, the thoughts about the trade war. Background, Chinese economy is highly kidnapped by real estate. I saw something today that... Uh, Chinese real estate for the first time in, I don't know if it was seven months, is starting to downtick. And you talked about this with me, Kuhn. The average Chinese person can't buy a home. The prices for homes are so expensive, they can't buy them. The trade war makes the environment tougher to deal with. Here are the thoughts of the average person collected from the Internet. 
It's a lose-lose strategy. I, well, I don't have to read this. You guys can see this yourself. The U.S. is afraid of the rise of China. They don't understand the, cooper the, the cooperative way to make progress. I seriously, China is a communist country and they don't have freedoms. And Kuhn knows that, and he does. When we talk about trying to use even Google Docs, he can't, he can't have access to Google Docs. We can't use um, certain downloads for, for videos. We, we have so many, so many t stuff that the Chinese people are blocked from that are just average things that we, we, we use in our daily, every day. We don't even think about it. Um, I seriously doubt that the Trump, uh, the purpose of Trump's launching a trade war is to pierce China's real estate bubble and trigger a collapse the Chinese economy. Um, well, it depends on what kind of freedom. Yeah, well, well, Kuhn, I mean, come on now. I mean, I don't think anybody's knocking, knocking you. I think it's an interesting discussion that we're having, but I think you see the freedoms that we have in the United States. Um, and, you know, you showed me your own hometown. I don't know how many million people you live in. And then they had the Chinese holiday. And, you know, there's, it's a big country. They've got billions, of, you know, we're talking billions of people. There's only 350 million people in the United States. So we do, um, that we do have a lot more freedoms. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into a political dialogue about communism. That's not what it's about. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the mindset of what the average Chinese person talks, thinks about, um, you know, Trump and his trade wars. Um, reflection of the economy. China will seek alternative importing sources for agricultural products. Well, they already have. The recent trade surplus of China hit us historically low last week, leading people um, to doubt about Trump's practice is effective or not. Stock market has multiple reasons to go down. Trade war is one of them, but not the single reason to lead the market to 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 a free fall. Huge amount of stocks are collateralized to security companies or any mortgage sources uh, from society for cash flow to become, you know, for cash flow by, by the company, making it mine and healthy growth of the market and and the quite almost, almost close 400 chairman listed companies. Okay, I'm not quite sure about that. That's all right. That's all right. We should have corrected that. No problem on that, Cohen. Um, the opinions about root of the trade. Um, superficially, trade uh, Trump wants to ease the trade deficit. The rising pace of China exceeded expectations in the Western world. The 2000, 2025 plan for China, that's the Silk Road, um, the launch of the petroleum futures will potentially harm the status of the U.S. dollar. And I don't know about that. I mean, that's they've been talking, Kuhn, they've been talking about the dollar, you know, not being the lead currency for the last 25 years. I think it'll be hard. The one belt, the, the one belt, one route by China will reshape the economy environment. That very well could. Some people want to be part of it. Some people don't. I, I, I read an article the other day that the, um, that the one belt, one route um, stuff is not as popular as what people think in Europe, and they're very suspicious of it. But anyways, um, uh, the disobey of WTO by China, but strictly speaking, which membership countries can say that they obey all the rules of well to. Everything is, uh, everything is similar with Japan right now. Well, Japan's economy has been, I don't, I don't know, Japan's economy has been in horrible situation for the last 20 years. The Shanghai Composite Chart. Well, I don't know. I, I think that in my own, in my own opinion, um, both China and the United States stock markets have risen substantially over the last 10 years. And corrections are always going to be part of the map. You got to, you can't, 
you can't have something go up forever without correcting. Do I think that um, China is being affected by the? Do I think China is being affected by the um, the trade wars? I do. I think that there's. I think you know when you're when the when the world's when the world's largest trading partner starts to complain about the prices he's paying or the tariffs that they're paying um, or not paying, it's, when these two when these two made the two largest economies start battling it out, there's going to be repercussions. And obviously, we all know that Shanghai Composite has rallied sharply over the last several years. So. Do I think that the friction between the United States and China is affecting the Chinese markets? In my, in my mind, it is. It is. I mean, I watch it every day. And the, the more negative talk that they have about this stuff, the deeper the decline gets. You know, the S&P is up 5%, um, and Shanghai is down 30 So, obviously, there's something there. Um, Kuhn says, yes, it does, but it is one of the multiple reasons why the Shanghai Composite dropped. I agree. Um, Shanghai Composite 2018 bearish completely. There it is. It's very, 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 um, very, very negative looking chart. And it doesn't look like it's going to end. I, I don't know. Maybe there's going to be some capitulation here. Uh, my, my hope is that the United States and China can come together, come to terms, and start working a little bit fair, fair deal um, on goods coming in the United States. But if they don't, I think that both markets will be affected, continue to be affected. You've got this global phenomena going on with the trade wars. You've got higher interest rates going on in the U.S. I would say that those are the two main drivers of what's going on here in the stock market. Um, Shenzhen, well, that... Yeah, the Shenzhen Composite is more of a um, technology um, index. So it's falling because, you know, more, more of this stuff, more of this technology-related stuff is and protectionism, the, all, these, all this stolen stuff that's been going on is going to definitely affect uh, their – this index is really a, a – an index for uh, technology. So technology stocks will be adversely affected by this if indeed there is a wider war on tariffs. Another another chart. Uh, these are Kuhn's charts. Ten years ago, the Dow and the Shanghai Composite are both at 6,000. But now the difference is where you put down the decimal point. Yikes. <laughs> That's a pretty pretty interesting chart, Cohen. Really, I guess I guess that's right. Um, but we'll see. You know, it's not over. I mean, everything. No, the technology. Well, I mean, Cohen. Here's the thing. I mean, you're you're a Chinese citizen, and we're not here to we're not here to beat you up or anything like that. But a lot of our technology has been stolen. You know, you know, had we. I'm not saying just by the Chinese. I, I, a lot of our technology has been stolen, and um, you know, I think that part of this is really trying to protect our own technology. Like, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into that discussion. That's not something. We're friends, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, anyways, we're going to have an end of the year um, pick the price of the S and P where it closed. We're going to give you 250 bucks. The person that picks the closest um, gets the, you know, picks where the s and is going to close at the end of the year. And that's going to be put in a link that John's going to send out. Now, I pretty much kept it in line with what I thought I would do, you guys. I went through these slides as quick as possible. Um, I, I may be a little scatterbrained because I put so much together. But I think that there are some pr pretty interesting points. I think, one, it's important to learn about the blackout periods. I, two, I think that analog chart um, comparing the 1987 crash to present is pretty important. Getting Kuhn's perspective in China. Um, 
tech cat out of the bag now advantages and applications of technology. I agree. Um, now, I want to real quick, before I turn it over to Marlon, um, I want to address the, the question about gold and silver. Gold has been going down, um, you know, quite steadily for the last several months. And again, I, I, I think it got down to 1187. And when it was at 1250, I don't know how many months ago, I came on Twitter and I said I thought gold was going to go to 1150. Metals tend to be, I don't want to say this, but if you, if you trade them and you like them, but they tend to be a fad. Um, they become very important in time of, like, wars. Like if there is an oil embargo, if there is an actual oil embargo and Iran tried to close the strait, you would want to be low on gold. Um, I don't, I don't, yes, it, it's recorded. Um, I, I actually I actually worked in the gold pit when gold went from like two hundred and fifty dollars up to six hundred or seven hundred, and I learned a lot about it back then. We were I was part of a gold arbitrage between the gold futures and um, the deliverable gold contracts, and I I saw so much bad stuff going on in there, and I always go back to one thought, and that's when metals start to move up, and you get all these commercials on TV. People saying, buy silver bars, buy this, you know, gold's going to $3,500, $3, silver's going to 1000 all this kind of crazy stuff. I, myself, am not a big believer in metals. But that doesn't mean, that's, that's just my vote. I've watched it go up. I've watched it go down. But most recently, over the last several years, it's gone down more than it's gone up. It has popped up recently. What's the most recent high in gold? I, I know it got... It went from under 1,200 up to like 1,225, like very quickly. Um, and for those of you that caught it, great. Um, do I think that you need to to hold actual physical gold as part of like a retirement play? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, if you own gold from 20 years ago, you're doing great. If you bought gold in the last several years, you're not really making that much money on this stuff. I, I, I don't I don't know. It, it's a very, very hard hard thing to do. Uh, by the way, what has Kevin Coy been doing the last 30 years? Went to his classes, subscribed to his well, he he he's still involved. Kevin Coy, I think, is one of the smartest people for for teaching market profile. I mean, he worked hand by hand with Peter Stottlemyre. And I was actually on the training floor when Peter Stottlemyre first started doing the market profile. He used to go to his office. I really believe market profile is one of the best ways to learn to trade the markets. Um, he lives in Indiana. He sells real estate part time. And he and his partner have begun to set up classes. And Mr. Topstop is going to be starting to offer some of those classes. He, they, they're expensive, though. You know, one of the things that we try to do is we try to stay away from, like, the, you know, selling the $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 products. But his classes are expensive. Raj's, Raj from Bank of America's um, classes are, like, $20,000, $15,000. Kevin wants to charge like twenty five hundred to three thousand, and we're working with him on it. Um, what we want to do with Kevin is find a way to do like a beginner's market profile. Yeah, he's he's unbelievable. JD, you're you're a hundred percent right. He probably am, am I right about this? Is he? Do you think he's the best market profile teacher you've ever met? Maybe in the world? I I think he is. His presentations are, um, who was the gold trader who trained, trained Louis Borsellino? Oh, that's okay. I think that was, yeah, thanks a lot. And I'm going to tell him you said that. What's your full name, JD? Don't worry, nobody's going to. So I can tell him. Um, well, there was a guy back by the name of Maury Kravitz back then. Um, 
I think that the Borsellinos worked for Maury Kravitz back in the old gold pit back then. Man, I don't know what, um, before Dalton. Um, well, do you think, I think Kevin's better than Dalton. But anyways, um, I don't, I'm not sure, but you know, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to close this out because I want Marlon to come in and do his thing. I want to thank everybody for coming in. Um, you know, trading, I'm going to finish it off by saying this. Trading's not easy. And anybody that says it is, is full of shit. You know, I, I, I do this, I do this. I'm, I'm like the pit bull. I'm, I'm on the trading floor. I used to read the boards after the trading floor. I've learned to read my charts. I look at volume. I look at buying and selling balances. And um, can I finish with a story today? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I've got so many stories I can't remember. But I'm going to finish this by saying one thing. The, the history of the floor, the trading floors, both in New York and Chicago, will be remembered by those colorful, colorful traders in the pit, in the pits, in the bond pit, in the grain pits, um, in the S and P pit, in the euro dollar pits, and, and all the, and the currency traders, and all that. And everybody had a very, very great time back then. Um, but there's a dark side to what's going on here. And last week, a trader that was in the ten-year note options killed himself. He has two small children. After after trading after after working for J P Morgan, working at FEMAT, um, and going in the ten year note options pit, a well known guy. I'm not going to mention. I'll just say his name is John. He committed suicide, and my friend Kenny told me that four people that he knows from the bond pit have committed suicide over the last four years. And I would finalize this by saying that it's now worth it. I know that there's a lot of people that have worked really, really hard to get to where you get to and, and, and want to make money trading. But there's other things in life you can do. If you're not successful at this, don't continue to throw money away. I know that this is maybe advice that some people don't want to hear. But if you ever get to a point where you're you're not feeling good about yourself, you're bummed out, you're saying, man, I'm never going to be successful. You can be successful. It's like my brother, Bill. One time I got, I got in a fight on the trading floor. Oh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a quick story, and then I'm going to turn it over to Marlon. I got on the floor on the trading floor. Uh, Jimmy Kalanis came down, the, a guy who claims to have been a bookie on a division and rush. He he says, I, I was a bookie at Division and Rush. And then one guy who was doing bets with him said, you know, Jimmy, maybe you ought to go down to the trading floor at the CME. Well, he went down to the trading floor, but he took his he took his bad ways with him. And, you know, if you're working for the mob, and they always said that there was the Greek mob and all this. Well, at the Board of Trade, as I've said many times, the Board of Trade was considered the Irish Catholic Exchange where I started. And the Chicago Mercantile was considered the Jewish exchange. And they operated differently. They really did. They hated each other. They did never got along. You know what I mean? And the, 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 the thing that was different about the Chicago Mercantile was that there was these quote unquote broker groups. In other words, two or three guys that were sitting upstairs controlled all the business in the pits. Instead of being an independent broker, being able to go in and fill some S and P's, you know, you 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 wanted to be, you wanted to go down to the Merck and you wanted to trade, but you wanted to fill orders. Well, more than likely, one of these three broker groups had ties to the the firm that you were going to be filling orders for, and if you showed up as an independent, you had to battle what these broker groups were all about. I got in big fights. I mean, one time Kalenis came down to the trading floor. I was on the phone with the Union Bank of Switzerland doing an index arb, and I was up on the up on the podium above looking into the S and P pit on the phone with UBS, and I feel this hand come around and whack me in the face, and I turn around, and it's Jimmy Kalenis, 
And I, 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 I tell the guy on the phone, I said, listen, I got to hang up. I hung up the phone and I get down. I go, Jimmy, what the fuck you doing? He says, you said this about me or you said this about, I go, I didn't say shit about nobody. And then he punches me in the face again. The whole fucking training force turned and looking. The Meads, everybody from the Meads is all looking. He, he punches me again. He hits me in the face. And all of a sudden, security guards are there. And uh, it was all about, we were doing all this business for Sheikh Mohammed out of Dubai, all this currency options business. You know, thousands and thousands of currency options a day. And he calls me up into his office. He's got the Zanzibar pants on. He's got the big pinky ring. And he's sitting there and he's, he's like, Danny, I want to do your currency option business. And a guy that ran the guy that ran the clearing firm that we uh, were clearing through LFG, his name was Steve Clemen. He was one of the three partners at CRT. He calls me up one day. He goes, you know, he goes, Kalenis is after you. I said, Kalenis is after me. I go, when I came to your firm, I told you that I wasn't going to be using them. I go, you got you got caught up in this shit yourself with giving all your firm's orders to him. I, I told you, I'm not going to do that. He's like, well, I saw him at a, a bar, of all places, a bar association fundraiser. And I'm like, I'm like, well, what, what does he want? He goes, he wants your currency option business. I go, I don't run the currency. I go, it's my operation, but I don't tell those guys upstairs who to use. They use who they think is giving them the best service. The guys that give them the best bills, period, the end. And Kalenis' guys are always fucking with the orders. And he's like, well, I'm just letting you know in advance. And I said, I, I, I said, Steve, you told me I wouldn't have to go through this. You just call him up and say, no, Danny's independent. He doesn't want to use you. A couple of days later, I get this phone call from Kalenis' secretary, Bonnie. And she says, Danny, Jimmy wants to see you. And I was like, Bonnie, I'm busy, you know. I tell him I can't come up now. I hung up the phone. A couple of days later, I get the phone call. Again, it's Bonnie. She goes, Danny, it's Bonnie. Jimmy wants you to come up. I said, okay, I'll be there at 11. I go up there. It was like walking into, it was like my walking into the mafia. And I, I, I sit down in front of him. He's laying back. His gut's hanging out. He's got the big pinky ring. And he says, you know, I, I know you've been traveling to Dubai and all that. And, uh, you got this big chunk of business. Uh, I want it. I'm like, you want it? What are you talking about? You want it? I go, Jimmy, I can't do that. I go, first of all, the guy in the S&P, Paul Carbonero, still owes, owes us $21,000 from a fucking error that he caused in the S&P. We haven't gotten a check for twenty one grand. You know, that's the first thing. He goes, hey, Bonnie, come in here. Starting today, Danny Riley's going to give us his currency option business. What? What are you not fucking hearing? What are you fucking thinking? He goes, in every order that we do, we're going to give him 10 cents back. I'm like, 10 cents back? I go, you owe me 21 grand. Do the fucking math. I go, it's going to take forever to get this money back. He's like, just use my guys. I look at him. I go, okay, Jimmy. I go, I'll tell you what. I'll tell my guys on the floor that we'll use you, your guys, but as soon as they give us a shitty fill, I'm going to tell them that they can go do whatever they want. He goes, our guys are better. We use, their, we use his group for a couple of days. They fuck us. They run over all the orders. They blow up everything. The customers are going, what the hell is going on in the pit? Well, these guys are fucking around. They're, they're doing their stupid stuff. So anyways, at the Merck, it was very hard. I mean, it was very hard. You know, I came over there as an independent. I worked my ass off. I fought those guys for years. One day I got in an argument with the guy, Paul Carbonero, that owed us the 21 grand. He told me, you know what he told me? He goes, you better not go on your boat this weekend. A can of gas may throw, uh, your boat may blow up or a can of gas may go, go flying through your, your windows of your home. I look at him, I go, you got to be fucking kidding me. I mean, I could have knocked his fucking teeth on his throat. And I, I call up compliance. I go, they're making threats about throwing gas bombs in my house or blowing on my boat. Oh, you know, we'll call him up and talk to him. But you know that's that's. What are you talking about? This this was a place, the Merck was a place where if you stepped into somebody's spot on the floor, if you went into the S&P pit, you were a new, new guy, and you accidentally sat in the wrong spot, you would get threatened. I mean, they, they would threaten you. The guy would walk up and go, you're in the wrong fucking spot, dude. You get the fuck out of here. You're, 
you're going to end up with a broken leg. I mean, this isn't the true shit. But anyways, at the end of the day, what I want to, what I want to get back to is this transition from floor trading and all these guys like this, all these guys throwing the confetti on New Year's, they're all gone. Tom Baldwin turned $15,000 into $190 million. He's gone. He lost it all. And the, the smartest traders are the traders that took that money and they invested it and they got out. The guys that, the guys, these guys that, that um, it was, it was the wild, wild west. But the thing is that no, everybody thought that it would never end. And it was a great opportunity for a guy like me, a street guy, to be able to get in there and make some money. And, and if, if you did the right thing, you could get into places like Union Bank of Switzerland. You could get into places like um, you could do the Bank of America business like I did for Raj. Or you could do the Moore Capital or the GLG or Citadel. All you had to do was be a hardworking guy and work for the customers, and you were going to do good. But the problem with what's going on now is there's guys that made millions and millions of dollars, and they're working at Home Depot. And 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 some of these guys just can't get through it, that they can never get back to where they were. Well, you know what? They're never going to. You, you know, like Jimmy Carey, Charlie Carey's brother, one of my best friends, I stood up at his wedding. He made millions of dollars filling the Corzine bond business he was the head order filler for the Goldman Sachs house desk. He used to buy 50, 80,000 bonds a day at a dollar a crack. You know where he is now? Take a guess where Jimmy Carey is right now. He's driving a forklift. Eight, nine hours a day driving a forklift. How is that possible? Was there no planning ever for when you're 50, when you're 60 years old? No, he had the key to he had the key to the bar around the corner. Um, he used to drink a lot, and he'd come in he'd come in half cocked on you know. And um, what, what's that bar near the board of trade? Alcox. He was friends with the owner of Alcox. He would go in there. He'd come in hungover from the from the night before. He'd go in the bond pit. He'd get a big order from Goldman. He'd lose his count. Buy twenty thousand, and he'd report that he bought twenty thousand, and and he was he couldn't check up five hundred that he bought from way below. He'd lose sixty grand, eighty grand in the first hour. They actually gave him the key to Alcox, and I wasn't working at the bonds. I, I would walk past Alcox, park my car at the parking lot on the corner, and I'd walk past Alcox, and there's Jimmy, in Alcox. He's got a key. He's got a beer. He's got a beer up there, and he's playing pool. You know, the bonds open at seven twenty, at nine quarter to nine, eight thirty. There he is in the bar. You know, and I I feel horrible for him, and I feel horrible for all these guys that that did well that never hung on to their money. But there's no reason to off yourself. There's no reason to get to that point in your life where you feel that it's not worth being alive. Talk to someone. I mean, I'm always around to talk to people, and I'm a great idea guy. But anyways, I'm going to leave it like that, you guys. There's always tomorrow. There's always a, there's always something else out to do there. I can't do Bashir. Oh, Alcox, yeah. But anyways, I want to thank everybody for coming in. Again, John will repost all these slides. I would really, really get a look at the Stock Traders Almanac stuff for going into the end of the year. But anyways, I've done my thing. I went a little longer than I thought. Marlon... You're taking over. He's got a new tool called Hotspot. And what we're going to do is we're going to give everybody that signed up for the webinar a free two weeks of my opening print. That is a newsletter that I produce. We put it out on Twitter. We put it out on the website. But it's we sell it now. It's not a, it's not a very expensive product. But we're going to we're going to give it to you guys the full letter, the full newsletter for. A month or something free of charge if you decide you want to sign up for it after that i think it's like 19 bucks a month you're not going to kill you with this but you're going to get my thoughts on trading my view of what i think the markets are going to do um i i think most people would tell tell you that they would give you a thumbs up on it and also um 
hot spot, Marlon's hot spots in there. So anyways, Marlon, you take over. Thanks for coming in, everybody. Have a great weekend, and Marlon's going to show you a hot spot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Hey, good job, Danny. Thank you. Can you, can anybody hear me? Can just get a yes so I know that my mic's actually working here. So, okay, John, thank you so much. Uh, well, let me get the slides up. It's just going to be 15 or 20 minutes. I just want to explain um, what hotspots are. And everybody should now have a uh, screen up that says heat map versus hotspots. If you don't have heat map versus hotspots, let me know. Um, so what, what, what I've done and what we're doing, and we're kind of still experimenting with the data because we're just generating so much data that gets confusing presentation-wise on the data. Thank you, Tim. Uh, is we're looking at uh, uh, times in the day where the market is, uh, reacts the same, but like little windows of time, okay? So we generate a heat map every day for uh, ES, uh, the, the, the Dow, YM, uh, NASDAQ, NQ, and oil. Okay. So we generate a heat map every day. We basically, uh, it's a one minute heat map. So basically we, we emulate making an entry in at every minute and an exit at every minute. Does that make sense to you? So, uh, 930, we'll do an entrance and an exit at 931. We'll see if we made a profit, not made a profit. We'll do an entrance at 930, 932, and the 930 all the way up to four o'clock. And, uh, uh, we generate a heat map that way. The heat map that's on your screen right here to the left is actually a daily heat map, okay? And uh, our heat maps we've been doing have been interday. So I worked last night and, and uh, said, just let's kind of fix this for end of the year stuff because we want to generate some end of the year data. Um, so the heat map you see on the left is uh, October for the last 11 years. So if I took and traded 20 days in October for the last 11 years, okay, and I entered on uh, October 2nd of this year, which is the trading day. They're kind of aligned on trading days because they don't really line up on calendar days because we have weekends and stuff. Uh, but that trading day, that first trading day this year was October 2nd. Um, if I entered on October 2nd, that's the entry along the top. And I exited on October 29th. For all 11 years, I would have made 84 uh, S&P points on that trade. Is that everybody with me on that? Let's see if I can actually draw this thing, turn on this white screen. Okay. So what I was saying is, ah, here we go. So if I enter here, and then I exit here, I hold for the whole, basically the whole, the whole 20, trading days, I would have made $84, 84.65 points, okay? So that generates a heat map for the last 11 years for the month of October, okay? Now, on the interday stuff that we do, we actually extract what we think is the best trade of the day, and we publish those on our website every day. Those are called hot spots. So those are the hot spots, right? You know, right in here is kind of a hot spot for this heat map here. We'll go through some heat maps uh, looking ahead here. But we, we extract the uh, hottest spots out of the map and then we actually publish them on the, the website. So the way to read the hotspot chart to the right, the table to the right, uh, this is for the ESF. This, these would be a, the best longs. Um, where it says normal, that means we just do a normal look back. Okay, 11 days. So this Looking back 11 days, entering at 2.27 in the afternoon, these are all, all Eastern time, exiting at 3.15, I mean 3.18, 91% of the time we would have turned a profit. That profit would have been that much, and it would have been about 40 points over those 11 days. So if all 11 days we had gone in at 2.27, exited at 3.18, uh, we would have been uh, uh, long. We would have been profitable 91% of the time. We would have made 39.75 points. So we're true in this to find out if there's any predictive value to today. So we know what happened last 11 days. What's going to happen to day plus one? And we've been doing this since about June 1st. Um, and uh, it really turns out that 
it really turns out that you really want to be in this spot here, the normal five and the normal eight. Those are the most predictive um, that we've been able to find so far. The other ones I think will probably drop. The other ones are using a Taylor look back. So instead of doing the last five days, we'd go one day, then we skip two, and then the third day, right, three-day cycle, and try and do it that way. Taylor plus can't count doesn't count weekends. Um, so, uh, I mean, Taylor Plus does count weekends, so anyways, we accumulate more data and everything. But there's an explanation on all of the lookbacks. But just to keep it simple, normal eight, normal five, those are the things to uh, to watch. Okay, heat map, hot spots. So hot spot is a spot extracted off of, a, uh, off of our heat maps. Okay, so, so Friday, I just did this... Uh, this morning, so I went back to look at Friday. I hadn't looked at it yet. Um, Friday, we published this. And again, the fives and the eights are the best. Uh, the five had predicted if you go in at 217 and you exit at 255, over the last five days, it's been 100% profitable. And it would have got you 45 and, and 45.5 points in that, in that window. Now, looking at what happened on Friday, purple one over here. Ooh, how do I clear this, this whiteboard stuff? I don't know how to clear it. Oh, it's not in the way yet. Uh, anyway, so the entrance was here. Oop. The entrance was uh, the purple on the left and then the purple on the right. Um, so pretty good predictive value on Friday for the long. And... Why can't I get to go now? There we go. And there's the short. The short normal five didn't exist on the short. It has to meet a filter in order to get published. It has to be over 80% uh, profit, 80% of the time predictive of those days. Okay. So on the normal five, there was no time slice within that entire heat map that um, was 80% uh, uh, profitable. Okay, so it didn't meet the threshold, but there was on the on the uh, eight eight day look back. Okay, so an eight day look back, an entrance uh, short at uh, one twenty two in the afternoon and an exit at four twenty. Eighty seven percent of the time was profitable uh, for uh, fifty points, forty nine point seven five points total for those uh, eight days, and then you can see that that was pretty predictive too as we kind of fell off in that uh, in that time frame there. So those are published every day. They're going to be in the um, uh, the uh, opening print that you're going to get every day for the next two weeks. So just use it. Don't, don't necessarily trade them, but if you have a trade set up and it's long, just take a glance at it and see if there is a uh, if there's if it looks like it's kind of a decent looking uh, hotspot area, um, and just kind of be aware of there is these times these time slices that repeat over time that um, have uh, some predictive value. So that's the hot spots. Okay. So now, continuing looking at these heat maps for the year, okay, we took the, took the last 11 years and uh, the last 60 trading days of the year, basically, uh, and looked to see how profitable the last uh, 60 days. And it turns out that, guess what? The last 60 days are pretty friggin' bullish. Um, and you can see here, this is the percent of wins, okay, over time, so the greener that it is is the higher percentage, red is lower percentage. So you can see that that uh, it really is kind of in that mid-November here. So uh, I really, for some reason, I'm attracted to this column. Let's see if I can get this pen to work again. Uh, my cursor keeps going away. I don't know what's happening. And then if I click, it goes to another slide. Oh, I can't draw. But if I could draw, I would draw a line right on that November 15th area uh, entry and then exit to the end of the year. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good hot spot in there. Um, and you can see that entering October 2nd all the way through the end of the year, uh, December 28th is, uh, is, is almost 100% profitable over the last 11 years. So that uh, gives you an idea of how bullish the end of the year is. 
Oh, I see. Okay, that's just 11 years. So then I, what I also did is we have a great database, a great calendar database, so I can extract dates. Um, and so what I did is I extract the dates of the, which wasn't too hard anyways, of uh, the uh, second year press cycle. So we're in the second year of Donald Trump's presidency, um, generated the hotspots for that. And uh, again, that continues to be very, very bullish. And it looks like just in the uh, beginning of December, there's some weakness there. And then uh, uh, getting down to, to the end of the year. But it looks like the end of the year actually was a little bit uh, uh, on that cycle, on those uh, two-day cycles was a little less where, you know, you might want to exit just a couple days before the end of the year. I'm going to give these these maps to you. And what we'll do is we'll extract some hot spots out of these maps um, and give you guys some trading days. Like we usually do uh, interday stuff. We have never really done daily stuff. So we'll have to work on that a little bit. And we'll give you some trading days to look at. Um, you know, go go long on uh, on November seventh, and and you know, exit on December seventh or something like that. It's 100% profitable over the last 11 years. So we'll give you some data on that to uh, to do. Jeff asks about drawdown and max lots. Yeah, we are accumulating those. Um, also, Jeff, we'll start reporting those in uh, in in with the data. Uh, Danny talked about 1987. We were talking this morning. I says, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. Let's just generate a, uh, a heat map for the uh, month of October in uh, 1987 and see how that looked on a, uh, on a heat map. And you can see, man, if you entered anywhere between – and, again, the dates don't kind of line up because the dates move around. Um, but if you entered uh, any time anyways before that 19th where the market fell apart, you, you never recovered. It was lost all the way down to the end of the year. Right. But if you were brave enough to uh, go in after the uh, selling was over on the uh, 20th or so, uh, there was some trading opportunities into the uh, to the very end of the year. And you can see that uh, really the hot spot on that map is uh, entering on uh, November, on December 3rd and holding to uh, uh, about uh, December 20th and 21st was about the, uh, the best trade you can do in there. And then. It's just another way of looking at the uh, at the same data, putting the, the heat map over the uh, over the, which might be a good way of actually presenting data uh, going forward. Putting the heat map over the actual uh, price chart itself, so you can uh, get an opportunity to see where the entrances look and don't look. And that's it. That is my slides. That is the total of my presentation. Hotspots, heat maps. We're working on it. Um, and we're looking for different types of correlations, which isn't just you know, right now. It's stacking five linearly back. We did try to play with the Taylor, like I said, three sequences back. It didn't appear there's any predictive power to that. The shorter, the better predictive power. Um, and we'll look at the dailies now and find that. Um, and we uh, also are integrating the MIM, so uh, uh, big uh, closing and balances, those kinds of things, and looking back and see how those uh, trade over time versus uh, the uh, – the hotspots. Hotspots are free. They're published right now. Um, if you are in our trading room, you get a little bit of advantage because uh, if you type slash heat in, it will show you over the next uh, 3, 5, 8, 13, and 21 minutes whether uh, the ES, the YM, or the uh, CL is bullish or bearish um, and gives you kind of an idea and kind of a, how the, the, hot, the heat map looks real time on the, uh, on the market as we're trading. And that is where we are. So any questions on the hotspots, heat maps? There's also a, a little bot that uh, needs to get be brought back online again. And a little bot uh, will publish a uh, the best. I mean, the thing the thing is it will trade it will generate like you know a whole bunch of trades during the day. So we got to filter them out and make sure we just do the, the good ones. So it will, it will, the bot will. Um, Send out the best trade of the day for ES, what it thinks the best trade of the day is for ES, long and short and CL. So you might see that on the uh, Twitter feed every once in a while, uh, and it will bring you back and to look at the heat maps. The other thing we don't do is we don't we don't publish the colored heat maps yet, um, and we're going to start doing that too. So you can not just see the hot spot, but get a general look for the day and see how the uh, the day looks over time, where, where it's kind of uh, uh, more likely to be selling and more likely to be uh, uh, being bought. Carl, it is just, we are just in the research part, so we're publishing everything. Um, 
And again, just go to the website, look for the red circle that says Hotspot. It's, it gets published every day at about, I think, 7.30 Eastern time. Uh, we gather all our data during the night, and then like 7.30 we publish it, and it gets put up there, and it gets put in the uh, uh, the daily. And and if you guys have uh, ideas, you know, and presentation stuff, because like I said, it, we get uh, lost in the data sometimes because there's so much data, and it's a uh, presentation that's a little bit difficult. We've changed the format. Because we had ES and CL, we had them all together in uh, a single chart. And people said, well, I don't trade this. I don't trade oil or I don't trade YM. I'm only interested in EF. So now we've separated the symbols out so you can just look at just the ES symbols or the uh, CL symbols and, and see how they're working. Okay, Gary. So I will look into that. You have to use a chart or resist. I don't know who who did that chart. So John's on here, and uh, we'll follow up on that. So you guys are all going to get the opening print if you don't want it. It's like, oh, please don't send it to me. I can just, it's easier if we send it. And just hit the unsubscribe, and you'll be completely unsubscribed. You won't get it. Yeah, I, yeah, I know you like the old one, Gary, but I don't know who it. Uh, I don't know who it was. Mr. Topstep dot com. Carl, www dot dot com. You don't have to do the www though. And if you want to be in our room, go to products. We have uh, we have the Iron Pro the Iron Pro chat room. Uh, which is a uh, a place where it's 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 really good traders. It's people who have been trading for a long time, and uh, uh, survival is all about being in this business uh, longevity wise. And so it's a uh, it's a group of seasoned traders. Um, we have a mem room, which is the uh, closing and balance meter that we do every day. Um, that's not quite as active as the IM Pro room, uh, except when it comes to the end of the day when we do our trades on the uh, on the imbalances, um, and, but uh, it's a great room, a lot of sharing going on, and uh, ideas sharing in there. Otherwise, I will say uh, good night and goodbye. And uh, let me just do a couple things for you guys. So go to the website, look over our products, go over the hot spots. Email me if you've got questions. That's the other thing, too, that's really great about uh, Danny, me, John, um, the people here is we're accessible, you know. Email us. Call us. We like to hear from people. We like to uh, work with them and uh, uh, try and uh, all try. We're all trying to do the same thing, right, get, uh, get ahead of the market. So Outlook is bullish. October, November, December, because we kind of all knew that. Uh, and particularly with the hot spots, it's saying mid November towards the uh, end of December is uh, the best space in there. And I'll put some uh, in the next two weeks, I'll do some guest posts inside the uh, opening print too. So you can follow there. I will say goodbye and good night. And thank you guys for uh, coming. Thank you, Steve.